Hello, everybody. I'm Laura Vosper, Oblis Support, Head of Talent, and I'd like to welcome you all to our second episode of Move the Needle, our masterclasses in success skills for our freelance lawyer community. Um, today, we're going to be talking about resilience and building resilience, and I'm delighted to invite, uh, uh, to welcome, sorry, two special guests. Um, Dr. Audrey Tang is a chartered psychologist, author, presenter, podcaster, um, her most recent book is um, A Leader's Guide to Resilience, and um, she's going to be talking to us today about some of the practical tips and um, learnings um, that she's brought together as she's worked on that and her previous books. Welcome, Audrey. Thank you for having me, Laura. And also um, Julian Harris, who is an executive coach um, specialising in working with founders and founder teams um, at startups. And Julian is also a commercial freelance lawyer, He's worked with clients including Nike, Sports Direct, Primark, and um, Julian, welcome to you as well. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. A couple of housekeeping points. Um, we are recording the session today um, and we'll be publishing this afterwards um, on our YouTube channel um, so that you can come back and watch this as much as you'd like to. Um, also, uh, we will be sharing a um, blog post um, after this as well. Um, and um, if anybody wants to ask any questions as we go along, we'll take those at the end. So, why resilience? Um, what I'd like to do today, obviously, is, is set us up with a session where um, we can perhaps challenge the idea that resilience is something that we're born with or something that's a trait or quality um, and actually explore resilience as a skill that we can learn, something that we can build and develop on that helps us um, succeed in our personal and our professional lives. So to start us off, um, Audrey, how do we learn to be more resilient? Well, let's start by understanding what resilience is. And a lot of people seem to think that resilience is just about surviving and just about bouncing back. Well, most of us can actually survive because that is instinctive. And when it comes to bouncing back, the thing that we tend to forget if we are applying that to resilience is that as we're hitting that crisis, the world has changed and the world has moved. If we bounce back to where we were, we may not be fit for purpose anymore. So resilience really, for me, is about being able to navigate three different dips. The first is crisis. And yes, that's unexpected. That knocks us for six. And generally, we can call upon the support of our friends. We can draw on whatever internal grit we might have just to try and hold on and get through that but it gets much harder at the point where we've through the crisis, but we're now exhausted and we then need to rebuild. And that is one of the key elements of resilience is being able to rebuild when you're already thinking, I just can't go on any longer. But then there's a third dip as well that we have to navigate because once we've got back to, okay, I'm all right, then why stop there? Why not go further? and actually thrive. So resilience is about learning to build our mental and emotional fortitude to get us through the crisis period, the exhaustion period, and then to push beyond that and to thrive. And it doesn't need to be that someone is simply born with these abilities, but it is about making a commitment to your mental and emotional health regularly, just as you might physical health, in order to build it for when you need it. Excellent, thank you. And Julian, is that um, that idea of building, I hesitate to say someone's building back better as, as the, we hear it, the, the government and media telling us, is that <laughs> something that resonates for you as well, this idea of thriving? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, I like that Audrey was talking about um, bouncing back, <clears throat> excuse me, as most people's understanding of resilience. I like to think of it, of it as not only bouncing back, but bouncing forward. Uh, and, that's, and that's what Audrey was, was absolutely talking about. That's the thriving, that's the thriving element of it. And, and in some senses, for me, it's, it's the most important. So, so how do we actually do this then? Because um, I'm keen that we get into some sort of practical um, ideas, methods, tips for, uh, from yourself. So take, for example, a situation where, 
you know, our confidence has been knocked. A situation has not gone well. We've perhaps prepared as best as we could, but something has not gone well or something unexpected has happened. How do we pick ourselves up and build back, um, not just, you know, back to where we were, but moving forward? Well, Laura, that's, that's, uh, sorry, is that for, that's Audrey? Oh, <laughs> thanks. Um, there's a series of different things that we can do in order to be able to uh, build back from that. When our confidence has been taking a knock, I like to call it emotional tilt. In other words, we have been knocked off balance and we end up behaving in very strange ways. Either we become quite desperate or we might, if things are going really well, become a little bit complacent. And it's about recognizing it. But the whole thing about any of these exercises is that they need to be doable. So here's a very simple one that you can think about in order to manage emotional tilt. And this is simply um, the A, B, C, D, and E of managing our emotions. Um, and the A is to recognize the activating event. What is it that is causing you to feel bad or to feel a little bit too sure of yourself? What is that activating event? It's, this is about conscious living, really. B is look at the behavior that that activating event suddenly produces. It's not about criticizing, it's about accepting. C is then the consequence. So you've had the activating event, then the behavior, but then what happens? Do you end up, if you're upset, isolating yourself and saying no to invitations? Or if you're feeling really great about yourself, do you end up being a little bit arrogant or a little bit too out there? What are the consequences? When you've got this, you accept that and you think, right, that's me, that's okay. The next part is where it, the work actually starts. And the D is what different thing could I do? What different behavior could I choose instead? And what this does is it reminds us that our habitual responses are simply habits that we're just used to using. There are a whole range of different behaviors out there available to us. And by simply thinking about them, it opens up our options. Now, it's all very well to say, yes, OK, I can do this. I can write this out. But actually, when it comes down to it, we need to have the motivation to be able to do it. And the, this is where the E comes in. And the E comes in at any point of the day. This is something you can do right now. This is something you can do as soon as this session finishes. And that is energize yourself to be able to do all of the work because change is hard. Changing habits is hard. Nothing is ha as hard as being stuck where you don't feel you belong. But energizers are little simple things like building up a positivity reservoir. For example, taking screenshots of the thank yous from your clients or photographs of loved ones or treasured memories and making yourself feel good. When you are vibing high, when you're energized, it is so much easier to reflect and make the changes you need. So this is something that I've used and I find it quite effective because it gives you a structure to follow. And, and you would use that sort of, would you advise using that kind of in the moment or as soon as in the moment as you can, or is that better to let sort of the situation settle a bit and reflect on? Often it is better to let the situation settle a little bit because emotions are can be very extreme. They can be very positive, very negative, and they, they're the things that tilt us. However, we need to remember that emotions are simply instinctive, but we can always choose our response. So when we have that time to step back and reflect on those things, that's a nice structure to use. I always advise clients or my students to journal and to have that written down. And that's a great way that they can then go back to it and reflect on it at a future date. Mm -hmm. and, and Julian, just thinking in there um, about that sort of energizers are there any other things that you recommend people do in their practice to tap into the the positivity if you like and and find the motivation yeah absolutely i think um energy comes can come certainly from the environments in which we live in which we operate um and we don't always think about that so one one great suggestion is to do an audit of our environment. Think about what or even who energizes us uh, and then spend 
more time with those people or do more of those things. And conversely, what or who, <clears throat> excuse me, depletes our energy. Uh, that's not always so easy. <laughs> people in our lives that uh, are energy vampires. Uh, and so spending less time or even no time with people like that will actually have the effect of boosting, boosting energy. And I think as well, um, Julian, it's fair to say there might be some extra challenges that come with the freelance lawyer life when it comes to this process of, you know, reflecting, understanding situations, um, then, uh, as Audrey said, thinking about different ways to respond and tapping into that energy, because, you know, it, it's a different way of working, isn't it, in terms of you don't necessarily have the environment and the structure and scaffolding around you mm. that you do if you're a, a kind of a full-time member of, a, of a, an organisation. Yeah, I, I think that's right. When, when, I, when I think about this, there are two, maybe two main things about being a contractor that, that stand out. One, one is just the kind of the general uncertainty um, of working life. Um, you, you never quite know when you're going to be out on your ear sometimes. It, it can sometimes feel like that. So that, that's, that's, something, um, that's something that it, it's important to, to try and navigate. The other thing is um, uh, often, certainly when you're, when you've, you're fairly new into an organisation, it can often feel like you're on the outside looking in. You're not, you're a part of the team, but you're not also not quite a part of the team. Uh, and, I, and I think kind of be bearing that in mind uh, and recognizing that uh, is really important. So, sometimes it's just the recognition of these things, labeling, labeling them, labeling your emotions, um, putting a name to it. That can be hugely, uh, that, that, that can help hugely with, with, with resilience. Mm -hmm. and, and in your own experience, have you found that building a kind of a network that's independent, if you like, of your work life, is that, is that a route you, t you take to kind of tap into for that support? You kind of mentioned, you know, thinking about people who energize you. Is, is that something that you found useful or that you'd recommend? Yeah, no. 100% and just drawing on, on my experience of at the moment of my, of my coaching business, building my coaching business, it's just me. Uh, and so what I've done consciously is to try and create a community around me or be, be part of uh, other people's communities. And having that, that support of people who are kind of with you on the journey or ahead of you on the journey is really, really important. And, and Audrey, it strikes me that given the events of the sort of last 12, 14 months, you know, for a lot of people will have found themselves in situations where they've been exposed to feeling lonely more than perhaps we, we would do in normal circumstances. It strikes me that um, one of the common things you're both saying is the importance of these networks and relationships when it, it comes to your own resilience. Have you got any advice to um, kind of help people counteract that. Obviously, this kind of constructing your kind of professional network. Um, what else can you do uh, to help manage that loneliness that can strike, do you think, Audrey? Loneliness is a very tough topic because it has, uh, it can be detrimental to our health to feel lonely. Um, it's also worth remembering, however, some people would may call something lonely, but other people may actually call it enjoying their solitude. So be mindful of whether you're lonely or whether actually you're quite happy being alone. Mm -hmm. And that probably takes me to the point of reflecting on our values. And this is just reiterating a lot of what Julian said know what it is you're looking for. So it's very easy for me to say, well, reach out, go and join a group, go and start a hobby, that's fine. But what happens if you end up in this group and in this hobby and then thinking, I really don't like the people here. So 
I've got a quick practical exercise that you can do that covers a few of these things. First of all, be aware of what your values are. Even write them down. Three things that you commit to and really think that this is who I am or things that you're not willing to accept. Knowing what you don't want can be just as important. So write your values down. But when it comes to perhaps reaching out and building up our network, and this can work for clients as well as it can work for friendships and people, um, you don't have to draw a cup, but you can. The reason I'm drawing a cup is because I want you to think about who you'd like to share a cup of tea with. And these might be people that you have in your life already, or they may be types of people. And I want you to write down the value of those people. Maybe they're kind, maybe they're funny, maybe they're generous, whatever those traits are. And if you've got a few of these cups, these are the people I want to surround myself with, these are the people I want in my life, then be those values yourself because we teach people how to treat us and if we are behaving in ways opposite to this how on earth can we expect these people to want to spend time with us but then there's a further thing and this relates to what Julian was saying about those energy vampires <laughs> if you then focus maybe at the end of the day on gratitude and on the people that you have in your life the ones that you're grateful for the things and the activities you enjoy doing and you do this for say a week you will notice that patterns will come up the same names will come up the same values will come up the same activities will come up and then you simply actively choose to spend more time in those pursuits with those people and you'll find the others are phased out because simply you don't have time for them or alternatively if you need to make time for them by chasing after and working actively to engage and to be energized, those times which are more taxing and draining, they'll pass by a lot more smoothly. I did take that away from your book, this, this um, principle of making these active choices. So always trying to tie what you're spending your time on back to what you value, who you want to be in the world. And, and that seemed to me to be a, a kind of core tenant of what you were recommending, really, and perhaps something we don't all actively do enough. You, you often hear, don't you, people nowadays, oh, I, I'm so busy. Um, you know, if people are lots of conversation I'm having at the moment as as we're kind of unlocking in the UK and and kind of perhaps you know social life and things are, are coming back oh I'm so busy I'm so busy it's it's so important for freelancers as well because one of the worst things is to keep adapting ourselves into something that we don't want to be just to get that job. But if we know what our values are, if we know what we uniquely bring to the table and perhaps the working environment we want to construct, it becomes a lot easier to seek that out for ourselves or recognize it when we have it and when we don't so we can actually cut our losses. We need to know when to stop because otherwise we fall prey to the sunk cost bias, which is we've invested so much time into it now. I can't leave. And that's a horrible position to be in. Mm, no, absolutely. That said, though, there are there are situations where, you know, you will be working with a client and overall you're you're very happy with that engagement. You know that you, you are working well together, but they are going to be by the nature of their work, especially in the legal profession, they are going to be making demands on your time and energy. So um, Julian, if I might start with you, how, how do we manage that? So how do we make sure that, that meeting those demands doesn't drain too much on the essential energy we need to keep our own personal resilience high? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And as, as lawyers, we are service providers, we are giving, and giving and giving and giving and if you do that too much without giving to yourself then you will burn out it, it's the, that's just that's just the way it goes speaking personally um I, I feel i can give a lot as long as every day i give a little bit to myself so what i what i try and do every lunchtime is get out of the office get out of the house go for a walk go and have a cup of coffee from Monday, we'll be able to sit inside as well, which will be great. I can't wait. It's part, it's part of my daily routine, so I'm very excited. Uh, but that's my way of decompressing. I might read, I might listen to the podcast, I might just sit there and stare into space. 
but I'm giving myself the time to re-energize so that when I get back home, get back to the office, I'm ready to go again. Audrey, I see you. I see you nodding there. Would you, would you build on this? This this sounds to me um, familiar with a, another concept you sort of introduced, which is this idea of being selfish. Yes. 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 We do need to be selfish in that we need to focus on ourselves. And exactly as Julian says, as a service provider, you can only provide the best service to others if you are providing that love and support and compassion to yourself. And when we talk about energizers, I'm talking really about um, self-compassion. It's not necessarily self-esteem and people mix the two up. Self-esteem is often in comparison to somebody else. But self-compassion is about speaking kindly to ourselves, giving ourselves time when we need it, learning to say no if we have to. So some practical tips there to find that time to sit in that coffee shop and, mm. and relax and give that moment to ourselves is consider asking clients empowering questions such as how can I best help you? What is it you would want from me? What is the best thing I can do right now for you? Because that way you're working with the client to come up with a solution. It's not just the client's thrown it at you, go and solve my problem. And of course, if you're in service professions and in care professions, you want to solve the problem. That's why you're in the job. But we need to learn ourselves to work as a partnership, as a collaboration, because then two heads are better than one anyway. So it works really well. And to pull up the other thing um, that Gillian's saying about uh, giving time to ourselves, work out what is going to be the most effective because if we've only got five minutes or half an hour, what is going to be the most effective thing I can do right now for me? And this is where you think about the yin and yang. Um, yin is much more relaxing. I want to listen to music or I want to listen to a podcast or I want to meditate. Yang is a bit more driven. I want to read something. I want to learn something. I want to chat with friends. What is it that really gets you going? Do you want to be energized? Do you want to be relaxed? What is going to make you feel good? And then decide at that particular moment, which of those things do I need right now? Because if we're feeling very anxious, then something that relaxes us is probably going to be more effective for us. If we're feeling particularly apathetic and down, then something that energizes us might be more effective to keep us going for ourselves and for our clients. So, so this is almost taking us into sort of ideas of mindfulness then. So, so being aware of ourselves enough in the present moment to make the active choice for the thing that's going to, as you say, either soothe or um, rejuvenate. Um, but making sure that we kind of switch on our conscious brain. I think what I personally, and I'm sure I speak for others here as well, it can sometimes be very difficult when you're in that moment to make that right choice. So how, how do we really grasp the moment? How do we, how do we make sure that, the, that we stop and pause and activate the right choice? You've actually used the acronym I was going to use. Stop oh. is a really <laughs> nice one. If you notice you're going around in circles or having the same conversation again and again and again, just stop. Even if you have to say stop out loud, what that does is it gets us out of our heads. That's the most important thing. The funny thing about mindfulness is sometimes it's about getting out of our head rather than pushing ourselves deeper into it. But saying stop to yourself and then the T stands for taking a step back and actually think about what is going on here? What am I actually trying to achieve? Once you've got that moment, so you've told yourself to stop, you've taken that step back, observe and think, well, what, what am I trying to do? How can I best do that? And when you feel calm, and this can be a very quick process if you're practiced at it, when you feel calm, then you proceed, which is the P, in the direction that you know is going to be most effective. The one thing that helps me, well, actually two things. Uh, one is an affirmation and the other thing is just something to remember. Emotions, which wrap us up and make us quite um, agitated sometimes, see them as a warning light. They're okay, they're, they're good because they tell us whether we need to watch out for something. But it's like a petrol light. When you see the petrol light come on, you don't necessarily need to panic or fill up straight away. Same thing with an emotion. If you're feeling angry or upset, then, you don't necessarily need to get it all out right now. You can actually think, well, 
what will be the most effective? The emotion is the warning light, the choice is the response. But the thing that actually helps me say stop and the affirmation that I use a lot is, even if I can't control anything else, I can control my breathing. And that works a lot better for me than calm down or deep breathe or just stop. It's, no, no, I will repeat that to myself. And that often just gives me that moment to say, okay, I can do this. Fabulous. I like that. I, I like that. Stop. I mean, everyone can remember stop, can't they? So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so excellent. And Julian, I know you've you've spoken to us before about the this sort of importance of breathing and, mm. and um, you know, kind of using your breathing to set the tone and change the tone. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And and we we I think it was you Laura touched on meditation. I I have come back to meditation after after a kind of a few months uh, off uh, and for the, literally for the last few weeks, 10 minutes a day, kind of formally, uh, and it, once, you, once you do, well, uh, let, me, let me use my own example, once I've, once I've done that day after day after day, 10 minutes formally, it kind of, I catch myself at various points of the day remembering to stop and to breathe and to become more mindful. And there are, there are loads of great um, apps out there for meditation. Right now, I'm using um, an app called Waking Up, which I, which I really love. Um, Headspace is great. Calm is great. And I think a lot of people are put off by the thought of meditation. It's a bit, you know, woo. Um, but... but and so find the app that's suitable for you because they, they, it's not it's not like that at all. And 10 minutes, that's all you need, 10 minutes a day has incredible aggregating power. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm a convert all over again. <laughs> and you mentioned one of the apps there, Julian, is called Waking Up. So yes. is this something you're putting in sort of first thing in the day or does it, can you fit it in wherever suits you? You can, yeah, it's, it's, it's whenever I think. I mean, I have meditated late at night. I've meditated first thing in the morning. I, I, I think in the morning is better to set you up for the day. But the, th the thing is, as I said, once you begin doing it formally, you then are much more able to catch yourself at various moments of the day and, and kind of just and meditate and breathe and stop and, become, and kind of become more uh, observant. Mm. Um, so you don't need that formal practice, but it's good to kickstart, let's say, the informal um, meditating. Mm -hmm. So that's some great tools then to kind of help when you're um, when you're on a project and when you're in the thick of things and taking that pause and and um, making those adjustments, kind of tapping up your reservoir, topping up, pardon me, mm -hmm. your reservoir um, with the meditation. You mentioned earlier, though, Julian, that the life of a freelancer is such that you don't always know where the next gig is coming from. And there is also stress that comes from being in between projects and being unoccupied. Mm. I just wondered if there's anything um, from your own experience you could share in terms of um, advice for our community in, in managing that and kind of maintaining your resilience in, in what can sometimes be you know, or sometimes feel like a stream of no's or a stream of the wrong sort of opportunity to go back to what Audrey said earlier. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I've got, I've got maybe an, an unusual take uh, on the stream of no's. Make it into a bit of a game. See how many no's you can collect. Because eventually the yes will be in those no's. Uh, making a bit of a game, making a challenge of it, somehow just sh shifts the way, shifts the pressure off, I think. Makes it a bit more fun, makes it a bit more, more of a challenge. Mm. Um, so that's, that, uh, that's definitely one way of looking at it. I, th I think in tandem with that, though, ha have, a, have a routine in place in your, in your own life, have a structure in place. It's very trite to say, get enough sleep, eat well, eat healthily, exercise. The, those are the building blocks 
for, for resilience. Um, the, the other thing is make sure your brain is active. And I don't just mean in meditation. If you're at a loose end, then you will be because you're not working. Learn. Use your, use your brain. Um, read books. Now that we can go to uh, museums and galleries again, do that. Get back to yourself in those times. See it as an opportunity for learning and growth. I think that's super important. Mm -hmm. So, so again, there's a kind of a bit of reframing in there, isn't there? See this time as an opportunity. Find find the the growth. Find the learning. Again, make an active choice to do something with that time, um, rather than viewing it as part of perhaps a more negative frame of oh, this hasn't worked out or this hasn't happened for me. Absolutely. Mm. And that I'm putting mind Audrey of them. Um, uh, a little takeaway from when I was reading your book where you, you sort of said um, and forgive me I'm going to pro pro probably quote this wrong um, but something along the lines of um, aim for excellence but not perfection because perfection is um, I think you're saying kind of subjective or perfection is a bit in other people's eyes and it struck me that that might actually be useful thinking for this time as well because it's not it's about framing what this means for you rather than chasing something that you know are you saying maybe perfection doesn't exist Audrey uh, yes I am saying perfection doesn't exist and it Me is too. a futile <laughs> <laughs> yes it's futile it's absolutely futile uh, yeah perfection is subjective and simply if you make it perfect for you I will guarantee you it will not be perfect to other people's standards perhaps and not only that but if you have for example stalled or missed deadlines because you've been fretting about making something perfect then you've got the added problem of you've probably annoyed everyone doing that that's why if you aim for excellence that is a relatively objective standard because we've got the standards of your profession but also you take into account how other people might perceive your behavior as well. And therefore, if you aim for excellence, it's probably a more positive and achievable target that you can have. Fantastic, yeah. And I can see Julian, you're nodding as well. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I completely endorse what Audrey says. I think the obsession with, with perfection, which probably has been exacerbated by social media is really, really unhealthy. Um, we can have perfect moments in our lives, but, but trying to be perfect or produce the perfect something is an illusion. And I think, and I think it's, it's really unhealthy to, to go after the pursuit of perfection. Mm -hmm. So, so it is about centering more in on your own values and your own understanding of excellence. And as you say, Audrey, drawing on what the profession understands excellence to be. Um, and, and, you know, in this in the sort of um, perhaps job interview type scenario, you can inform your understanding of what excellence is likely to look like for the person that you're meeting and the project and, and what they're likely to want to achieve with that project but lose this idea that there's some kind of magic perfection and you're not measuring up and, and that's kind of taking you in a downward spiral. Absolutely. Um, one way that we can actually do a lot of the things that Julian was suggesting when it comes to having time as freelancers, but also to find what's going to suit us is by using, this is a, a well-being wheel actually, but I like to apply it to lots of different contexts. My students use it for uh, writing essays. I like to use it for uh, what makes us fulfilled and what makes us happy, but you can use it for say seeking your ideal job. You draw a wheel and you draw or eight segments into it and you decide on what your goal is so your goal is landing that dream client whatever that might be to you so as an example then you fill in each of those segments with the things that you want to be doing to achieve that goal so it might be as Julian said reading learning more about that particular field so reading the second one might be researching the different opportunities out there so that might be another one 
research, uh, then it might be making sure your mental and physical health is tip top. So our fitness might come in there as well. Our meditation, our um, time for ourselves, our self-care. Uh, it might be professional exams that we need to do and so on. So you've got your eight different categories. And then on a scale of zero to 10, you then need to mark on each of those segments where you are. Maybe you love reading. So you read loads about your subject. So you're somewhere up here, you're like at eight or nine in reading, that's great. But you know, you've got this idea of where you want to go, but you haven't really researched it because you don't like the internet, you don't want to do that bit. So your research is at a two or three. Your fitness, maybe you've made excuses. So maybe that's at a two or three as well. Um, but you're doing really well on your legal exams because you, you read a lot. So that's up here at nine or ten. What this does is it gives you a visual representation of where you are. So first of all, you know, if you think, right, how do I get to this particular goal? I'll read more. Well, actually, you're kind of doing a lot of that anyway. Isn't it better to maybe channel that energy into one of the two other categories instead that are lesser? And then when it comes to channeling that energy, it's not about saying, oh, I'm a two. How do I make it a 10? But simply, I'm at a two. How can I make it a three? And then doing that one thing to actually nudge you up to that three. Oh, I like that. I like that. And, and one thing I would say um, that, that comes up quite a lot in my conversations that I would put on that wheel is LinkedIn. Because I have a lot of conversations <laughs> with people who don't find LinkedIn necessarily their, their kind of natural home, but actually it can be a really, really useful tool. And I definitely think having that as a segment on that type of wheel and giving yourself a nudge, I love that, just nudging one notch up. You're not trying to go to 10, you're not trying to be, you know, the next kind of, I don't know, Bill Gates on there or something, but just kind of nudging yourself up by one, one point, um, and just trying something different and doing something a little bit different. That's, that's good. Uh, by, by the by, on, on, on LinkedIn, this is a bit off topic. I had some LinkedIn coaching recently. Uh -huh. uh, and so, you know, for anyone that, that uh, wants to know how to use LinkedIn better, I can certainly recommend, recommend somebody. So we can put that in the, in the, in the, in the notes afterwards or, or however you want to do it. Excellent. I love it. Um, and, and that's a great example, isn't it, of making an active choice of, of saying, OK, this is something that maybe I don't naturally gravitate to, but I'm going to invest some time and effort and I'm going to try this and see where it takes me next. And, and also what you were saying earlier about, you know, reaching out into a, a network or a contact, drawing on some extra help outside of yourself is not all on you. Actually, resilience is about how you prepare in times of calm for when crises might, might strike. And that's about how you build the network around you um, and how you tap into your sort of future plans and people around you to help you with those future plans as well. Um, rather than I think sometimes we have this image of resilience being all about just the internal grit you mentioned before, Audrey. Yeah, it's not. It's it's about actually building. It's again, it's about building emotional and mental fortitude. And the best time to do that really is at the time of calm, because it's at the time of crisis where the internal grit kind of comes through because you're just trying to survive. But to go beyond survival, and that's the point of resilience, is to really build up those things. So some questions you might want to ask yourself in that period of calm might be, well, actually, if you knew this disruption would have lasted longer than the 12 months or the three months that we thought it might have been at the start, what would you have done differently? Or to reflect over the last year and say to yourself, honestly, what worked? What didn't? And use that to inform your decisions in the future. And with the informing decisions in the future, you need to be aware of where your clients are. So, for example, now the businesses that are thriving are the ones who have got the online websites. They are the ones who are able to deliver because the consumer behavior has changed. So it's the same thing. What are my clients doing right now? What are they looking for? What is it that has changed in their behavior? Because if we don't keep the finger on the pulse, what we end up doing is re-preparing to bounce back which isn't 
what Julian's saying, which is to bounce forward. It's about moving with the times and allowing yourself to succeed and giving yourself the best opportunity to succeed in the future that you're going to move into. So I would always say, ask yourself, if I knew what that this would have lasted, what would I have changed? What would I have done? I'd probably ask myself what worked and then I'd look at what are my clients needs right now and where will those clients needs be in say three months time six months time and a year's time and how can i prepare for that mm. i like that julian that strikes me as something that would be a good routine to fall into yeah, between yeah. projects is that something that you find yourself doing sort of in between projects and engagement? I, uh, so i think this is a for me it's an ongoing mm -hmm. it's an ongoing process um and so, yes, it's important to, in times of calm, to put these practices in place. But, but for me, it, it's almost a daily thing, you know, looking at, looking at what I've done, how, you know, what did I do well, what could I have done differently? Um, I, I think that kind of, that self-reflection on, on a daily basis is, is super important. Mm. Um, just just uh, um, with, a t with a twinkle in my eye, I have to take Audrey up on the, the online shopping um, comment. I do a lot of the legal work for Primark, who of course famously don't have an online store, so I have to defend, uh, defend the Primark business, uh, <laughs> than, um, the, the business model right now. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. And I, and I think Primark, Primark has a niche in all on its own as well. So the customers maybe aren't looking for the online. It, it, it's you you need to understand the client so i i i take that hit julie <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think we, we've seen haven't we people flocking back as the, as the shops reopen on yes. the high street yes um so i just wanted to to um and we're, we're we're coming towards the end of our time sadly i could i could talk all day about this it's all so interesting but um we are coming towards the end of the time and i just wanted to think a little bit we talked about how um, we might draw upon others to help us. We might be selfish in, in, in our relationships with others. I'd also like to think a little bit about how can you help those around you to be more resilient? And what's making me think about this is often um, our obelisk consultants are, are going in to support teams that are very, very busy. That's the nature of our work in a way. We're helping to provide that extra support at a particularly busy time for that team. So we're going into that environment. Our consultant isn't necessarily going in as a leader of that team or a manager of people. Are there things that you can do that can help in the, the wider sense, as well as deploying your technical skills to get the work done. Obviously that's the primary purpose, but we all know that just technically doing the work isn't what a job is about, is it? It's about these other things as well, about collaboration and, and, um, and being supportive in the wider sense. So what are some of your thoughts there? Um, Julian, I might start with you. Uh, it's an excellent question. I, I think what, what comes, what comes up for me uh, or came up as you were asking the question is just because we're not in a formal position of leadership as consultants doesn't mean that we can't be leaders. Um, I love sport and I, and I use a lot of sporting uh, analogies in, in my life and, and it's the same. It, think about a team, think about a sports team. Okay, and a new, a new player comes in. Um, that player can still be a leader in the team, just even if they're not captain or vice captain. And it's the same in, in an organizational um, setting. And for me, as a, as a consultant or a contractor, I'm not, I'm not a team leader, but I do want to lead by example. So I want to show my colleagues through my behavior um, what resilience looks like. And so, um, for example, if I see a, um, a colleague that might be struggling, offer to talk to them, you know, provide, provide support in, in whatever way I can and, and they find helpful. So, so 
Just, yeah, I, I think for, for me, resilience by example um, is, is, is the answer that I'd give to the question. I like that resilience by example, Audrey. I know I know you've done a lot of thinking about this sort of resilience in an organisational context. What would you add to build on that? I think that's so nice because I've literally Julian said it much more eloquently. Resilience by example. I've got role modelling, so it's, it is about doing what you're expecting from other people. But Julian, you make a really key point about how the leader isn't necessarily the person with the title. You only need to go into an organization and see who's got the most influence and it's not necessarily the one in the big office with the door. So be aware that you can influence no matter where you are or who you're with. Um, using a very similar analogy, this one sort of comes from aerobics teaching um, and it's the NLP match, pace and lead. When you go into an organization, it's very tempting to kind of look at it and go, oh, I need to make all these changes. But actually if you match match alongside with people for a while see what's going on and really seek to understand it and then you begin to set the pace so you might make very little tweaks that uh, you can try out see if they work maybe with smaller groups and then see if that can expand uh, later to other other groups um, and then you can establish leading so it's not necessarily about going in and then trying to make changes immediately because there might be some things that are fundamental to how that organization works and it's the same thing with resilience when we talk about resilience it's not about tearing down everything that's that's there and that's wrong uh, it, it's about respecting that the foundations are what makes you who you are and then building up around that so just adding to that really is just the match pace and lead technique mm, mm. No, that, that is good and I think um I think it's also about being able to just make sure you make time to look around you as well isn't it it's very tempting we've all done it where you come in with a new brief and you kind of your blinkers go on a bit and you you sort of put your head down and focus on your work but actually and I see you're nodding here Julian I don't know if you want to come in it's about looking around a bit more yeah 100 um, percent inevitably when you go in you're part of the team um, and upstairs, there are times when it's appropriate to get your head down and do the job, do the work. And then there are times when it's appropriate to get your head up and, and yeah, see, what's, see what's happening. See, talk to your colleagues. Talk to your colleagues. How are they doing? Um, uh, we, might, we might come on to this, Laura. We've been living in a world of, of Zoom and other platforms are available. Um, for ages now and, and it makes connecting with our colleagues much more difficult in, in some ways we're much more available but are we having those conversations with each other that, they, that we would have been having um, in the office or in my case in the cafe around the corner at lunchtime I think that's a really, really good point, uh, Julian, and thank you for, for moving us into this, because this is the, the sort of last area I, I wanted to talk about today. And I, I'm interested, you sort of saying it's much more difficult to make these connections because certainly at the moment, all the signs seem to be that hybrid working, um, certainly for professions like the law, seems to be here to stay. So how do you overcome the the kind of the screen barrier because you're right it, in some ways we're more available we can jump on a, a video call at two minutes notice but in other ways it does somehow put this barrier between us actually finding it's not it's not the barrier that's the problem um it's the fact that you because you're not in the same environment as somebody else and certainly when you're in a big team you, those, those conversations that you would ordinarily have don't happen. So you have to actually schedule in conversations with colleagues. The, the, you know, the, the, the kind of the regular team meetings are still happening, but those off the cuff conversations aren't. Uh, and it's very difficult. It's impossible to replicate that unless you just suddenly, you know, dial someone up there and then and hope that they're there. So the, the, the alternative to that is scheduling them in. Um, and what I've found is that um, many of my, 
colleagues aren't so good at doing that, but when I reach out to them and make make the connection, they're really happy to have those conversations. Um, so, yeah, the, the Zoom has made it far easier in some respects, but 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 definitely far harder in others. Or, Audrey, did you want to add to what I was saying? Definitely, because you've actually brought us back full circle about being conscious and making our active choices. And you're absolutely right. One thing I find as a trainer is in a face to face situation, I can read a room, but I find it very difficult on Zoom, especially in a webinar, because I can't even see yeah. how people are doing. So it is about actively managing those expectations right from the outset and saying, if you do have questions, put them into the chat or telling people that you can have this time in order to speak or making time before the class or after the class in order to um, have the Q&A. Because in a team meeting, often what will happen is there'll be a little coffee break and then you might be able to go and sneak a word with somebody that you needed to talk to. And of course, that doesn't afford, uh, Zoom doesn't afford that to us anymore. So it's up to us to reach out. It's just because somebody else hasn't said, I'm going to make this time for you. You yourself have that confidence to go and reach out and make that time for you. Mm -hmm. and it is interesting because we're, we're almost getting to this point and, and we've actually done this a little bit in the central team in Obelisk where we have this sort of scheduled spontaneity, if that isn't too much of a contradiction in terms. So, you know, we've actually done things like booking in just sort of a half an hour to do a sort of silly online game or something just completely sort of purposeless in one in one sense completely aimless in one sense but just to have some kind of connection that isn't purely task focused um that that can just bring the group together because you know uh, over a year in now to working this way and we are missing that connection yeah, um, yeah. and i'm uh, sorry, Julian. No, I was just one, one other way of doing it is when you're having more formal meetings, make some time, suddenly when there are large groups of people, make some time at the end, make it known at the beginning that we will be staying on afterwards just for a chat. That's another kind of practical way of ensuring that there's that, that kind of interpersonal contact. Um, Zoom, Zoom meetings are very functional now, aren't they? And 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 the, the chit chat that we would have face to face is gone. So um, it's really important to try and bring some of that back. As you say, what, what was that phrase you used per, about spontaneity? Um, ske scheduled spontaneity. There you go. So yeah, <laughs> schedule it in at the end of the meeting. We're going to have a chat. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm particularly minded um, that I think it must be very difficult for people who are early on in their career as well, because I do think there's so much learning that you do in that space that isn't scheduled. Yes. You know, that is the, the you know, impromptu connections you make, as you say, Audrey, at the tea break or whatever it might be. And um, I think it will be really interesting to see how our organisational cultures adapt so that we fill that gap, because I do think that's going to be an important um, gap to fill, yeah. um, particularly in the legal profession, um, where, you know, so much of learning early on in your career is in effect done by essentially shadowing and joining yeah. meetings and all of that piece. So I think it will be interesting to see how how the profession develops. And again, it kind of takes us full circle in a way because it, it then comes with kind of responsibility for those of us who are more established in our um, professional careers to to kind of pay it forward and to to sort of set up that support for for the more junior side of our profession and and sort of help them um come with us um and and not lose that benefit that you know i'm sure each of us can think of moments earlier in our careers where we've we've kind of benefited from the completely unscheduled impromptu That's right. <laughs> connection um so just one uh, last thought then, which was just something you, you did say for me uh, there, Orgy, that resonated, which was we need to have that confidence to us to make the connection. And I think um, I wondered if you could just expand on that slightly, just in terms of how would you advise us to just have that permission to ask for that contact? Because I do think that's really important at the moment that we feel, you know, that we are empowered to ask for that if we need it. One of the um, 
it's I read it in a book and I, I can't remember the writer, the author, unfortunately, but the statement was those who ask will sometimes get knocked back. Those who don't ask will never get knocked back because they never asked. But those who continue to ask will one day get the response that they want. And I think it's about telling ourselves that whilst we can learn from other people, we are equal to them as having a right to be in that space as a human being and therefore to not put ourselves in a situation where we have to or we feel we have to ask them to come to us or wait for them to come to us. A, a lot of this is about reframing our internal dialogue and one of the ways that I get my clients to look at this is just thinking about well what voice do I want in my head? Is it the voice that says I can't do this or you shouldn't do this or you should wait? Or is it a voice which is a little bit more empowered? Ask and if that doesn't work, ask somebody else or maybe it's the way you asked and learn about it. And again, the conscious choice then becomes when we are in that dilemma of should I say something, should I not say something, then always just think about on a continuum of this is my ideal self or this is my not ideal self where does my choice of behavior sit and know that we can actually make a choice to move it towards our ideal self. Audrey, thank you. And Julian, thank you. And I am going to draw us to a close here because we are sadly almost at the hour. Um, but this has just been such a great session because I think to, to take us back to where we began, you know, this idea that we can thrive, that we can bounce forward You've given us some really excellent practical tips and advice and shared some of your own experience to really bring how you put that advice into practice. And, you know, it's, it's you know, it's relatively easy to read these things on a page or to to kind of, you know, think, oh, yes, I must do that. But what you've done is you've really brought to life how we can do that and how we can take that away um, and put that in every day. So I am really excited. I'm going to be writing all of this up um, to share um, so that uh, as well as people being able to tap in and watch this, um, they can also have something that they can take with them and keep coming back to. Because I think we really did, you know, whether it's the positivity reservoir, whether it's thinking about putting that bit of meditation into our day, helping us with the stop. I mean, you packed this hour with practical tips and advice which is really fantastic so um on you know for myself and uh, on behalf of the obelisk community thank you both very much it's a pleasure thank it's you it's been fun let's do it all over, all over again <laughs> <laughs> next time <laughs> thank you and goodbye okay.